about four months ago or so, um, I decided to go on a business trip with my brother to Chicago just so I could hang out and watch him work and eat and have fun and not have a very spiritual time at all. And of course, those are the times when I feel like God speaks to me the most when I'm not trying to listen and then he won't leave me alone and he wants to talk the whole time um, that I'm away. Anyway, I was in Chicago and I was leaving my brother at the conference center to go and meet a family member who uh, is in law school downtown. And I was walking down the streets and I was getting on the subway to go downtown uh, to meet them. And as I, as I was, I felt like the Lord wanted me to, you know, open up my little phone Bible and go to a particular verse. And so I went to a particular verse in Isaiah 55 and I began to read a little bit. But then before I knew it, I backed up a little bit and I began to read. And then I ended up reading like 10 chapters on the metro train. I almost missed my stop. And it was such a powerful experience because the way I was reading it, and this is an Old Testament scripture, and this is an Old Testament prophet, and the language is highly figurative, and there's lots of different ways you can take it, and there's lots of theological debate on the different ways you can take it. There's a New Testament perspective, and there's an Old Testament perspective, and there is a, you know, there's the perspective of those of us who believe that Messiah was Jesus, and there are the perspective of, you know, Jewish theologians and others, and so the, the book is very interesting, and of course we can derive a lot out of it, but it's not always easy to interpret. But I was noticing as I was reading it that, that it was very easy for me to interpret. Now, it doesn't mean I was interpreting it correctly, but it was very easy for me to interpret. And it was so powerful as I read it. And it was as if God was speaking to me loud and clear right off the pages. And I knew immediately that he wasn't just speaking to me. He was speaking to the church. He was speaking to my church. And I began to see that it read like a covenant. And not even that, it read like a strategy. And, and I was quite convinced um, that the Lord was speaking uh, to me and to my church, to Monterey Church, California, Virginia, Maryland, uh, past, present, and future, um, through this passage, and it was kind of like he was making us a deal. Uh, I know that's not a very holy way of looking at things. It's the devil who comes along and makes deals with you, but sometimes God makes a deal. It's called a covenant. And it was as if God was saying, you know, Brian, you could use this kind of ancient text, which is still my living word, and properly interpret it and apply it to your body, and it's a covenant. And it's also a strategy. And I, was just, I just fell in love with the passages, and I fell in love with the words, but I, you know, I didn't feel like it was time yet. We were beginning the John series, and I was getting excited about preaching that, and so I repressed it for a while, and it would come back from time to time, and I would l read it, and I would get really excited again, and I knew that God was speaking through it, and I was like, man, I, it's going to take forever to get through this John series and get into Isaiah, but you know, we'll, we'll get there, and I can't wait. And then around the time that we had our 24-hour prayer event, on a couple different campuses in California uh, and in Virginia, a friend of mine, one of our elders, called and said, you know, those, those verses, those passages in the book of Isaiah around chapter 50-something to 60-something, those are so powerful. God had me in those the whole prayer event. And I began to think about them again, and then I finally became convinced that I was repressing the will of God and the word of God, and I said, okay, I'm going to call a timeout. And in the midst of John, we're going to take a time out, and I'm going to preach from these seven chapters or so, at least seven, maybe more, because there's more after that, but at least seven chapters from like 53 to about 60, 59 in that range. We'll see where it goes. And I really feel led not just to preach it and teach it in the normal way, but to make sure that we get it in sequence and that we really listen and we really consider it as an offer and an opportunity from God, as a covenant from God to us, and perhaps a strategy for how we're to live our lives um, and to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. The book of Isaiah, um, according to a lot of scholars and commentators, can be broken down into either two or three sections. Some, uh, almost everyone agrees the first 39 chapters or so is the first section, and then after that, through, verse, uh, through chapter 66, would be a second section. And some people would break that second section down into two parts as well. And, m and many, you know, believe that it was written by actually not just Isaiah, but different writers. They believe the first part was Isaiah, and then a couple other writers came along later to write that second and third part, or at least one writer 
came along later to write the second and third part, but many believe that Isaiah wrote the whole part, uh, that the entire thing was written by Isaiah. There's just a lot of speculation. What I do know is that God wrote the whole thing. It's very well written. It's written in the proper sequence, and it all belongs together. I have no trouble believing that Isaiah wrote the whole thing. I mean, a lot of scholars say the way he writes, his language becomes more figurative as he goes along. But I think that's because he begins where he is with what he knows, speaking to his audience. And he begins to speak to an expanded audience as he goes through and he begins to prophesy through time. I think his, I think his writing and the language changes because his experience changes. And so there's lots of reasons, plausible reasons, that, that all these changes could happen. But regardless... Um, All of this was from God through the prophet, whoever it might be, and for us. And this is a very powerful and important uh, book, um, regardless of what our theological persuasion is, even in the New Testament. It is actually foundational for all the Bible. Isaiah is actually directly quoted about 85 times in the New Testament and many times in the Gospels. Uh, Many scholars believe that that John and his gospel is the one we're in now, that that entire gospel was written um, to prove that Jesus was the Messiah um, as articulated in the book of Isaiah. And so it is incredibly relevant um, to us just for our knowledge and our edification, but I think um, I would go and be as bold to say that it is even more relevant for you and I right here, right now today at Monterey Church and as we move forward because I believe that it is a covenant that God wants to make with us through the blood of Jesus Christ, beginning with the cross, and a strategy for us as we go through. And so what I would say to you today and as these weeks unfold is simply this. I would just simply say to listen. Um, Whether you're in California or in Maryland or Virginia, whether you're getting this on the internet or in some other form of media, whether you're getting this uh, live in church when I'm preaching it, whether you're getting this in the future as you go back through the archives, uh, whatever your context, I would just say, please listen. And listen in sequence. And listen um, as much as possible um, uncritically. Um, Maybe come and listen with a childlike heart and just consider what God might be saying to you. Listen as I preach. Take notes as I preach. Study it um, almost academically. Enjoy the word and be edified by the word, but also let it study you a little bit. Uh, What is God saying to me through this verse? What is God saying to me through this passage? What is God saying to me through the theme through which uh, Brian brought out of the passage? What is God saying to me in my quiet time next week as I unpack what I heard on Sunday and what I've begun to read in the Bible? What is God saying to me as I listen to my D group discuss this and, and, and apply it to their own lives and unpack it? What is God saying to us as a church? I would just really encourage you to listen, um, to lean in, to be still. Um, because I think anytime we open the Bible and we preach God's word, it is very important and powerful and we should listen. But I just have a feeling that this is one of those special times. You know what I mean? Like, there are a lot of days that I get a little something out of my quiet time. There are other days where it just floods me, right? And I really believe that God wants to flood our church through the passages and the pages that are to come. And so I just encourage you to suspend judgment for a moment, if you have any, and lean in and really listen and consider what God is saying to you and to our body. Be edified, be challenged, be encouraged. Uh, The way this book reads, uh, it doesn't begin this way, thank goodness. It begins with a a, a huge chapter in chapter 53 that's all about grace, all about Jesus, all about the cross. And that's good because because pretty soon we're going to get into this pattern of really high demands from God, but with even higher promises. Um, A covenant is often written um, in, in relationship with a stronger party. This is a really simple way of describing a covenant versus a contract. A contract is where two parties come together and I'll give you this and you give me that and, it, and we find it to be equitable, you know, supply and demand and we find it to be equitable and we make a contract that seems good for both of us and we'll, we'll stick to the contract as long as we stick to the terms of the contract. There's no grace in the contract. Uh, you do your part, I do my part. As soon as we don't do our parts, we break the contract and then we have to go to court and seek damages, right? That's a contract. A covenant is different than that. 
A covenant is kind of a stronger party saying, if you'll do this, I'll do this. If you'll believe on my son and give your life to him, the one who gave his life to you, then I'll give you eternal life on earth and and, and forever in heaven. If you do this little thing, which is just to come with a broken heart, a childlike faith before God, and to believe on him at the cross, and to continue to surrender and submit to him imperfectly and with fits and starts through time, then eventually you'll go before the throne of God and you will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, even though we had a lot of bad days, enter into the joy of your master. In other words, that's a covenant, right? With a, with a party that's, that's greater than us. And so um, as we go through this, we're going to see that pattern a little bit. It's a strategy for establishing the kingdom of God on earth as it shall be in heaven, but it's also a covenant. And God's going to ask us to do some really hard stuff, but at first he, he starts by giving us everything through his son and promising us everything in return. And so um, what I would say to you today is you got to kind of be ready for that. And and the high demands, the way it's going to really challenge us in our faith as we move forward, it would be tyranny without the Holy Spirit. It's going to be hard with the Holy Spirit, but it would be absolute tyranny without the Holy Spirit. And so I love the fact that we get to begin in chapter 53, which is all about the grace and love and the atonement of God being washed in His blood so that we might be filled with His Holy Spirit, that we might have this capacity for righteousness as, he, as we seek him in the future. I believe, the, I believe that the covenant is sufficient and the love of him, the grace of God is sufficient that even if we fall away for a time, he'll bring us back. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. But I do believe he's going to say some things that are a little bit severe and will slice into our heart a little bit and we'll kind of push back on and we'll wonder if it's even gracious from time to time. But the truth is it might be the most gracious moment we've ever had in his presence. Because high demands bring high rewards. And as we work out our salvation, sometimes with even fear and trembling, um, we recognize that we have this opportunity um, to share in the suffering of Jesus Christ and to experience a glory that we've never, we've never known before. The book was written, as, as I said, maybe perhaps in three parts. In the first part of the book, um, to oversimplify it, Isaiah is speaking to his current audience, to Hebrew people, to Israel. And, and they seem to be, at this time, historically, according to commentators, they seem to be doing pretty well. They're making pretty good money. They're pretty comfortable. And because of their circumstances being so pleasant, they kind of assume they're okay with God. And Isaiah is there as God's messenger to say, not really. Not so much. You think you're right with God, but you're not right with God. And then he begins to prophesy a time when they will be disestablished and taken into exile. And then in the third part, where they'll be reestablished. Now, where we pick this up in chapter 53, we're kind of coming out of that second part and transi- transitioning into the third part. And, and, and I know a lot of scholars would say, and a lot of people would say, but also a lot of people would also say what I would say, that this, is, that this third part is very much about the reestablishment of the state of Israel, which we, you know, we have seen in some form. They're less of a theocracy now and more of a democracy. It's not exactly like they're at their gilded age, but they're a pretty strong nation in the Middle East, despite their enemies. And I believe that is a fulfillment of prophecy, perhaps even some prophecy in Isaiah. But I would also say to you, I really do believe this third section um, speaks, a, speaks at a higher level at the same time. And, and, and that would be, um, I believe that Isaiah is prophesying the reestablishment of spiritual Israel, um, which includes all of us who are being grafted into Israel through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said in Romans chapter 2 that, that a true Jew is not one who is circumcised outwardly. A true Jew is one who, is, who has their heart circumcised um, by the Spirit of God. Um, if you can imagine your heart being dead and covered in like maybe fat and corrosion and, and, and ins- insensitive to God and insensitive to his spirit, Paul is saying it's like God's word, his spirit, it slices in there and it slices all that away and it makes it vital again. And so Paul said a true Jew is not one who is circumcised outwardly. A true Jew is one who is circumcised inwardly, circumcised at the heart um, by the spirit, not by written code. 
And, and so what Paul was saying very early in that very theological book is that whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you've come to Christ as your Messiah, uh, you're a Jew now. And, and you are now um, spiritual Israel, as we talked about a lot in the book of Isaiah. And so I have, I have no reason um, to believe that there isn't a, an appropriate message coming out of this section for the New Testament church. And as I've already said over and over again, especially our church, right here and right now. The section we begin in today actually began in chapter 52, and I'm not going to go there. I'm going to pick it up in chapter 53, but this whole section is called the humble servant. Jewish theologians believe that that this humble servant that's spoken of as one um, is the nation of Israel. It's Jews who've been oppressed through time. They think that this is kind of a metaphor for them. Uh, Some people might say that it could be, in a sense, but there are some reasons that we can't believe that to be true because it's clear that the suffering servant that we're going to read about today was a holy servant, a perfect servant, and one who was so worthy that he didn't die for his own sins, he died for the sins of all men. And so this servant, um, it, it really just can't be the nation of Israel. As much as they have been oppressed and as much grace as they have brought the world, and as important as they are in history, it's not them. Some might say, I haven't heard this so much, but some might say that this is a metaphor for the New Testament church. And indeed, a lot of the ways we see that the the servant would suffer, uh, we will suffer too, and and our brethren around the world have suffered. But this is speaking uh, first and foremost about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ. It It is Isaiah, 700 years, I believe, prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, describing Jesus Christ with um, amazing accuracy. I mean, when you read these verses from our perspective as New Testament Christians, knowing the story of Jesus Christ from the Gospels, it is breathtaking. I mean, you can't believe that this guy saw so clearly through the corridor of time. Uh, To me, it's like, of course his language changed. Of course he became more figurative in his speech. Of course, even if uh, whoever wrote this, but probably Isaiah, of, of course their diction changed. Everything changed because they weren't writing it. Uh, God was writing this, and he probably didn't even know what he was writing fully. He was, just, he was just amazed at what he saw through time. And so we'll pick it up. We'll start the sermon now, an hour later, in chapter 53. It's going to be very important that we listen to these in sequence. So if you miss the sermon, go online and listen to the next one, because I think sequence is incredibly important. In this chapter 53, I'm telling you, if it wasn't here, I wouldn't even want to go forward, because the obedience and the demands of God that are to come would be absolute tyranny without the atonement and the infilling and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is critically important. This is, this is where we start. In Isaiah 53, verse 1, the prophet writes this. Not so much him, but Christ in him. He writes with a, with a kind of a provocative question. He says, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, he's about to describe further this humble servant. Um, but he's asking kind of a rhetorical question. Who's going to believe this? As certain as it is that this person is to come and provide um, a substitutionary atonement for the sins of the world, um, who's going to believe it? And so uh, what, we're about to, what we're about to read, this entire prophecy is written past tense. And I think it's written past tense because the, the writer wants us to know, though it has not happened yet, it most certainly will happen and happen perfectly um, as I prophesy it. I think it's written past tense because of the certainty, and I think it's written past tense to expand his audience even to us. Because, it, you know, the, the history of Jesus Christ very much is past tense to us. But, but, he, but what he leaves uncertain is the response to this. Who will respond to this? Who will, who will, um, who will, who will it be revealed to? Now, the arm of the Lord very clearly is, uh, is Jesus Christ to me. Uh, We read in other places in the Old Testament that that God looked down from heaven to earth to see if any were righteous, if any sought him, if any were any good anywhere, and there were none, and he was appalled, and so his own right hand worked salvation for him. And so we understand that to mean that the Son, Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of the Father, was brought from heaven to earth to work salvation for us. He He was conceived 
um, mysteriously and secretly by the Holy Spirit into the womb of Mary. And he grew up in Galilee and, and 30 years later began to make his appearance. But, but God came and became the catalyst for every good thing. And that's critically important. Uh, when you think about God sitting in heaven and he looks down, I mean, what a fool's errand, right? I mean, who would go from heaven to earth to lead people that don't even want him? Uh, who would go from Georgia to California, from California to Virginia, from Virginia to Maryland to start churches? And, and really, our target market aren't those who are after God. It's those who aren't after God. I mean, where does that confidence come from? It comes from the catalyst being from heaven and, and, and the certainty that God will do what he's going to do. But the uncertainty is who will respond to that? In verse 2, it says, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. In other words, he didn't come with pomp and he didn't come with circumstance. He didn't come in the way that, that many thought the Messiah would come. He didn't come like King David riding on a big horse and, and slaying Philistines in his path. He didn't come and, and, and immediately take the throne. He didn't show all this superior intelligence immediately, but in time we see that he very much did. But he came in this very un, underestimated way. And, and, and I think there, there are a couple really good reasons for that. First of all, we know that he was conceived in the womb of Mary, um, very majestically, but kind of secretly. We know that he was born in Bethlehem, but not like a king. He was born in Bethlehem and placed in a manger. We know that he hung out in Galilee, which was not at all one of the greatest cities of Israel, one of the least cities. And he grew up there, and for 30 years, he just did mundane work uh, around the house with his father, his earthly father, a carpenter, before he kind of arose on the scene. And so you may say to yourself, why wouldn't he make a bigger deal of his coming uh, in order to win more followers? If his idea is to bring people to himself, why wouldn't he do that? Well, the first reason is um, because he's coming as a servant. And when he comes again the second time, he'll come the way we expect him to come. But when he came the first time, he came as a servant. That first entire section of the book of Isaiah um, and kind of rebuking them in their comfort and their opulence and thinking they're okay with God when they're not, a big part of the criticism that the prophet had for them was that they were called to be a servant nation to, to demonstrate the glory of God for the world. And, and they had instead turned to serving themselves rather than to serving God and serving all of humanity. And so Jesus came to correct that. He came to fix it. And so he came as a servant. That was one reason. He also came to, be, uh, to show us who follow him kind of the model for how we are to live our life. The second reason that he came in this kind of underestimated way was that he wanted to save us. And we know that salvation comes through faith. It is by grace through faith that you are saved. And so if, if faith is the evidence of things unseen and he appeared on the scene and showed us everything all at once and required no faith at all, then there would be absolutely no justification by faith. And so he came to demonstrate that he was a servant. He came to, to give us the opportunity to receive him, you know, by faith. And, and, and he came in this way um, to model that for us as we begin to follow him and move forward with him in the future. In verse 3, it says he was despised and rejected by mankind. Isn't this, isn't this wonderful, like the way Isaiah, can you believe Isaiah is writing this about Jesus so clearly in the past tense? I mean, he had to wonder, I bet he wrote this down and walked around for a month wondering if he was crazy. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. This is a clue that, that, that the prophet is not saying this is us. He's saying we didn't even recognize him. We despised him. We, Israel, held him in low esteem. We haven't yet, but we will. And, and the evidence that we will is the way you're treating me right now, Isaiah could say, the way you're treating Jeremiah, the way you've treated the prophets and stone those sent to you, the way you treat them is the way you're going to treat him. Even with his inbreaking now, Isaiah could have said, that will be what the inbreaking will be like then. But this is a clue that this is not the Jewish people. As many wonderful things as they have done and as much as they have endured, this is 
someone different. This is the Messiah. A great application for us in this might be um, looking at this verse and, and recognizing that the way God continues um, to come to us and to demonstrate his grace and his word in our life is still in a very underestimated way. Um, it's, it's still in a way um, that requires faith. Um, Jesus said in John chapter 6, which we were in not long ago, I think it was chapter 6, he said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. He goes back and beckons the question, who, to, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, to those whom the Father reveals them to, who by the power of the Holy Spirit emanating from the Father have this awakening. And what, what I would say to you today, the power of this verse for us today is um, we should be absolutely overwhelmed with awe and gratitude if we know who Jesus is. If we don't despise Christ and his word and being one of his people, if we're unashamed to go out in that parking lot and be baptized in the horse trough in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with everybody in our neighborhood driving down 29 honking at us, if we're not afraid to go um, to the, into the ocean at Lover's Point in, in California and be baptized into the ocean with literally hundreds of people standing around, some applauding and some of them going, those people are crazy. If we're willing to draw close to God, it is because he has first drawn close to us. If, as we get into this, this passage and these, and these pages ahead, and we find ourselves not only challenged by the word, but also kind of excited to obey God and to do the things that he's calling us to do, if we're willing to share in his suffering so that one day we'll share in his glory, if we're willing to lay down our life as a sacrifice to the one who gave his life to us, if we love Jesus, if we came to the cross and we had that moment of clarity, we should be filled with incredible gratitude. And the other thing we ought to be very careful about not doing is underestimating that. Do not underestimate the experience you're having with God just because he comes with a still, silent voice. If you're beginning to be awakened to his presence and his love for you, something extraordinary and unique and very rare has happened. And what I would say to you today, and this will be a theme that we'll, we will, we will hit on t several times in today's teaching, and, and especially next week when we're in a passage that dives right into it, what I would say to you today is when you're having that moment, drink deeply of that grace. Drink deeply of that grace. Like, don't minimize it. Don't back off from it. Do not harden your heart dive in you're gonna need it uh, take it take the whole uh, chalice which is christ's blood and drink it and drink it deep i, I had a friend in, in high school and we, we would finish cross-country practice and he was a weird guy and he was really he was one of the best runners on our team and we had a good team and the coach was always don't drink soft drinks don't drink soft drinks they're bad for you drink water drink Gatorade be a healthy athlete but after every single practice especially when it was really hot he would get like a 20 ounce thing of coke and he would kill it I mean I'm and it made me jealous I was like I wish I could put that acid down me that fast but he drank deeply. He drank like he was thirsty. He, he, he did not minimize the moment. And what I would say to you is do not minimize your moment with Christ. If you're having one right now, drink deeply of his grace. What is happening to you is the most important thing on planet Earth. There, there may be no other reason for you to exist than to have this moment of, with God and to drink deeply of his grace. You, you cannot follow him. You cannot be empowered by him by doing this little dance and pushing him away and staying out and making deals with him. You've got to come all the way in. You've got to be unashamed. You've got to say, I want all of it. I want everything, and I want nothing else. And I'm telling you, the church in the United States of America, we are hemorrhaging. And I don't have a, I don't have a, um, a study to quote to you right now, but if I wanted to, there are hundreds of them. 6,000 churches a year are shutting down. Less than 600 are opening up. As our population soars, the percentages of our population that love Jesus Christ are plummeting. We are hemorrhaging. 
And, and I think the reason we're hemorrhaging is we're not built on the solid foundation. I think the reason we're hemorrhaging is we, we've created these environments of church that make it palatable and plausible to come in and, and to live without conviction. And, and I, don't want, I can't handle it. I want us to drink deeply of the grace of God. He was despised and rejected by mankind. If you don't despise him, if you're not quickly dismissing him, if you're hungry for him, if you're drawing near to him, it's because he's drawn near to you. Do not underestimate the moment. Drink deeply of his grace. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Uh, It's not sure who will receive it, but he surely is going to do it. And he surely did do it, as we know in history. We have all the evidence this man didn't even have. Surely he took up our pain, our pain. Israel, spiritual Israel, all who would believe. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He's kind of saying he he was taking our punishment, but while he was taking it, and he's speaking about the future. He's looking down the corridor of time. The Jewish people were saying, this is God judging him. No, it was God judging you through him. It's complicated. It's confusing. I can't believe how well this man is writing. But he was pierced for our transgressions. It wasn't for his. It was for ours. He was pierced for our transgressions. Transgression is sin. Deviation. To sin is to fall short of the glory of God. To sin is to miss the mark is the perfect definition. Uh, the, The high holy standard for creation was here. We kept landing here. There was a transgression. There was a deviance. And somebody had to, justice had to be paid. And this man paid it. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was cursed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Uh, One thing we see in this passage, and we see it all throughout Scripture, is the will and the power of God for salvation. Entirely upon Him. Um, It's it's God saying, "I, I have the desire to save you, and I have the power to save you. I am absolutely zealous to save you, motivated to save you. Even when you don't want to save yourself, even when you don't need or think you need salvation, even when you think that you've you got it all together. Uh, and when I see you and I see my children lost and backwards, even if they feel comfortable for the moment, uh, my heart breaks. And, and the will of God is to restore us and to make his name great again, not apart from us, but through us. And so I have the will and I have the power. And in time, that will translate into you having willpower to follow me too. But on the front end, it entirely emanates from the desire of God. Surely, absolutely, certainly, willpower. We see here substitutionary atonement. Scripture teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It might go on to say without the shedding of pure blood, um, unpure blood can't be saved. Uh, If any of us died for someone else, so to speak, we might have done that in kind of a a time and space way. I might have taken a bullet for someone. I may have gone overseas and served the military nobly um, and died for my country so that people could have life, liberty, and peace for for a, a period of time. But eternally speaking, we will all have to give an answer for ourselves. And no one can die for us in heaven except the one who came from heaven and who was the perfect human sacrifice for our sins that would be jesus and jesus alone he had to be god because he had to be holy and none of us were holy but he also had to be man which is why he was conceived in the virgin mary and so he was the perfect holy god but he was also man god man the perfect human sacrifice the one and only in verse six it says we all like sheep have gone astray Each of us has turned to our own way. Some of us may be better than others, but we're all prone to stray from God and to miss his mark and to sin. And it says, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a wonderful thing. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And and, and this this Jesus came, and he surely took up our infirmities, and he he reconciled us to God. And, And the beautiful thing is, In time, even on earth, before we get there, 
his righteousness, his blood, his spirit will be poured into us and we'll begin to actually be righteous too. Not perfectly, but ever increasingly. Uh, some of us, if we, if we dive right into this sermon without getting in chapter 53 first and we pick this up a little later, we're going to think this is performance-based righteousness. We're going to think we're earning something from God, but nothing could be further from the truth. This is righteousness-based performance that is first and foremost a gift of God from the cross. You get that? Uh, sometimes when we go to 2 Corinthians 9, you know I love to quote 2 Corinthians 9, and I say, if you sow generously, you'll reap generously. That seems like performance-based righteousness and reward, doesn't it? But the truth of the matter is, grace was already at work before that equation ever began. It was God who graciously, by the power of the Holy Spirit, called us to him. It was God who graciously, through the atonement, through the blood of Jesus Christ, brought us into a right relationship with him. It was, it was, it was his spirit mingled with that blood that filled our hearts and, and brought us to this place and get, put something in our hand to begin with and gave us the illumination off the scriptures to give us the power to respond to it and to participate in this, in this flow of grace. If you get this in the right or wrong order, this is bad. It, it, it won't go down well at all. It will, it will leave you disillusioned and a little bit angry. But if you drink deeply of his cup of grace, if you truly have a born-again experience with God, this is going to light you up. It's going to fire you up. As high as the demands are, the promises are higher. And I know that God hasn't called me to do anything that he won't give me the power to do. As I rode on that metro train in Chicago and I read my phone, which was the Bible, I'm, I wasn't upset. I was deeply challenged. I was deeply convicted. But I mean, I was also filled with optimism. Because I knew God wasn't calling me to do something that he wasn't going to embed me with the power to do. And I knew God wasn't calling me to preach something that he wouldn't give you the power to do. And I knew that if we could receive this word and the power that goes with it together and begin to obey it, we have a strategy to build a church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. This is the most important thing in the world. I'm convinced of it, not because it's my word, but because it's his. In verse 7, it says he was oppressed and afflicted. Jesus Yet he did not open his mouth. Remember before the, the high priest and before Pilate, he wouldn't speak up for himself. What do you have to say about yourself? He wouldn't speak up for himself. He wouldn't offer a defense. You know why? If he had offered a, a defense, he would have set justice into motion. Angels from on high would have come and fought on his behalf, and they would have won. It would have been a rout. And all the demonic forces driving these people to drive him to the cross, would have been, they would have been pushed away. But that wasn't the will of God. He kept his mouth shut so that these things would unfold according to the plans of God. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He loved me and you so much, he did not open his mouth. I don't know about you, but when I'm being unjustly accused, my mouth is open. If I'm about to be nailed to a cross, I'm talking. Even if I'm guilty, I'm offering a defense. And if I know there are angels and armies that will whip all their butts, you're all dead. Be grateful that I'm not your Messiah because you'd all be dead. <laughs> but he loved us so much, and for the joy set before him, he endured it. It says in verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? And that generation that was around, who protested? Even the disciples ran and hid like little girls, didn't they? Now, there was no one really by his side on that day. Peter denied him three times, and he believed. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth I, I, irony he, evil nailed him to the cross and he allowed it so that he could defeat evil uh, one of the words in there it's a really little word but but it's an important word and i don't know if you picked up on this but he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death now you may think that i'm going to overemphasize that word in context with the scripture but you're about to see in the chapters to come that there that there's something to that 
The word rich there could also be um, translated to say in meaning, not direct word, you know, not etymology, but in, in meaning the selfish, the exploiters. Um, those who are strong, the survival of the fittest, the Americans. Uh, those who thought they deserved what they earned, even though it was in, in great portions over what all around them were earning. Those who made themselves rich on this earth were rich towards himself without being rich towards God. Those who t- took their life and accumulated and, and, and brought it all in rather than letting the grace flow. And, 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 he, and he counts, I mean, it's right there with the wicked. The wicked and the rich. And it goes back to the first section where some of them were in trouble. They were, thought they were doing well. They were living pretty decent lives. They felt pretty blessed and prosperous. They felt safe in that. And I know, you know, the word social justice doesn't get very far in today's church, and I don't believe in social justice in the institutional sense, but I'm just telling you, this is foreshadowing, God's coming after you where you live. He's coming after lifestyle, he's coming after wealth, he's coming after all the things that we hold most precious. And he's going to make some high demands, but good news, he's going to make even higher promises. And he's going to really get in our grill about some stuff. And he's going to really challenge the way we're executing our life and our lifestyle and our plan. And, and the good news is he, he is the source of every good and perfect gift. And he wants us to enjoy what, we, what he gives us. But what we don't realize is that, that we're stewards and not owners. And we have a calling on this planet, especially us, especially the American church. And we have a calling on this earth to, 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 to demonstrate his grace and to execute his justice in the way that we handle the things that he gives us. Relationships, careers, notoriety, fame, wealth, health, whatever it might be. If indeed we are to be a Romans 12 Christian and make our lives living sacrifice, he's coming, man. So I'm going to encourage you while we're here, drink deeply of his grace. Because this, this grace must fill you and it must flow out of you. Otherwise, you're going to hate me pretty soon. And I hate when that happens. I want you to love me. I want you to be fired up from his word. And I'm telling you, he's doing to me what he's doing to you. I only lead you as he's leading me. But, I'm, but, but the church in the United States of America, we're hemorrhaging. And, and this is one of the reasons. Uh, we're, more like I, we're more like the Israelis in, in, in the early part of, Um, of the book of Isaiah and and perhaps we're in an era now where he wants to reestablish us but he wants to reestablish us in righteousness and in justice and that's exactly the kind of language that we'll be getting into soon fires me up I hope it does you too yet it was the Lord's will to crush him it was it was God's desire it was his purpose to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. This is prophesying his resurrection. Uh, Though he will be dead and buried on the third day, he will rise again. And not only will he rise again, we will rise again spiritually even before we ascend to heaven with him. And and, and it's basically prophesying that he's going to have offspring, uh, that people are going to be born again. It's us. We're his offspring, unless we're not. But I'm assuming most of us are. We're his offspring. In other words, yes, you're going to suffer. Yes, you're going to die. You're going to be crushed for their iniquities. But the good news is that through faith and through people coming to you, Jesus, you're going to have offspring. You're going to have children. And, and, And through them and through their resurrected life on earth before they get new bodies in heaven, not only will they, you know, love you and be born again in a real theological sense and have intimacy with you, but, but through them, God's will will prosper. And so he's, uh, the prophet is prophesying a multiplication to his resurrection and a multiplication um, to his ability to submit himself to the Father's will. You might say, you know, in Gethsemane, Jesus was there, and, and, and he was really struggling to do the will of God. I, I strongly encourage you to read that chapter. If you think we don't work out our salvation with fear and trembling, if you don't think it's hard to do the will of God in these bodies of death we live in, look at how Jesus struggled with his own body. He said, may this cup pass for me, uh, Lord. I don't really want to do this. But then he said, no, 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 not as I will, but as you will. 
and, 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 to, and to bring his body, uh, to, to train his body in obedience to do the will of the Father and bring salvation to the world. It was, it was such a difficult moment. His closest people had fallen away. They had fallen asleep, and he was all alone, uh, and, he was just, and he was sweating blood. And none of us will probably ever have to suffer that much to do the will of God, but it is a perfect metaphor for what it is uh, to allow the Spirit in us, which is willing, to overcome the flesh. And the prophecy here is that we will be born again in the Spirit, that we will have that Spirit alive in us, and in time, imperfectly, not as good as Jesus did it, we too will multiply his, his obedience in the way we live. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. It will be great satisfying by his knowledge, his knowledge of humanity, his knowledge of suffering. Uh, if we, it's the fellowship that he has with us in understanding temptation and suffering, the knowledge that he gained taking on human form, and, and that could mean a lot of other things too. But by his knowledge, my righteous servant, Jesus, will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. In verse 12, Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. It's as if the father is speaking to the son. And he will divide. I love this because this gets me excited. He will divide the spoils with the strong. That's us. Those who are being made strong. He will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And, and, and you could read this. This is a great launching off point for the rest of, of our teaching and what will be in this book. And, and there's more grace stuff next week. Good news for that. I know this didn't seem like grace, but it was. And, and there's more of that next week. But we can see a launching off part. He's going to share the spoils with the strong. You know what that means? It means we're going to be strong. And, and Isaiah is prophesying that those who come to him through faith will be made strong. Strong hands, stout heart. Uh, the willingness to follow Christ at all costs. I want to share in his suffering. I want to share in his glory. I want to make my life a living sacrifice. The word martyr means to give their life for something. You know that we can be a martyr in a sense without ever dying for God, but just by making our living life a sacrifice to him. And we're going to want to. And we're going to get to. I'm not going to have to. It's going to be bad if we don't, but we get to. We're going to want to. He's going to fill us up with that kind of character from the inside out. He's going to build us on a, on a solid foundation and give us strength and passion and courage. I find myself more and more when people have issues around me and they ask for my prayers, I find myself more and more um, not praying for mercy, but praying for grace in the form of courage. And I, and I find myself more and more not pray, praying that circumstances would change, although sometimes I do, but I pray for God to raise them up in the circumstances. I pray for peace and joy beyond understanding. I pray that they would have wisdom and a strong, uh, a strong mind and a strong heart to walk into that situation and see it for what it is and speak the truth and love boldly and just be, you know, it's our birthright. The righteous are as bold as lions. I want us to be like Jesus when he's, sitting, when he's in a scene with, with all kinds of trouble and turbulence all around him and he stands there flat-footed knowing that they will not touch a hair on my head unless the Father lets them touch a hair on my head and my time has not yet come. I want men and women to walk home into their house and, and take authority over that house for the glory of God, knowing he will give them the strength. I want us to walk into our jobs and all the different places where God has us and make us strong and make us generous and teach us that regardless of how difficult the scene is, spiritual truth is spiritual truth. And if we go in that place and we sow generously and we, and we sow graciously and we don't exploit people and we don't use people, if we serve them like Jesus serves them, then we will reap that way as well and we'll glorify him. That's the man I want to be. I'm not sure I'm there yet. And that's the church that I want to lead. And that's, the, and that's the witness I want as people come into this body. That's the witness I want them to have. They may come and they may go, but I pray that we get to a place that when they go, they'll at least say, those crazy people believe it and they live it. Because then we will be on a solid foundation. High demands, high promises. But it didn't come first without God giving us everything through his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him, whoever would give their life to him, 
would not perish but have eternal life, and that eternal life would begin on earth even before we get to heaven. And I am, I am absolutely convinced that, that the book of Isaiah, it, could be, it, it, it is quoted 85 times in the New Testament. It could be restated in the way the New Testament is written in many different ways. But in these pages to come, I believe that we have ourselves a covenant, and I believe we have ourselves a strategy. And I believe that Isaiah was being carried along by the Holy Spirit as much for us as anyone else. And I am so grateful for the atonement of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to open up these scriptures to us and allow them to land on our heart. Drink deeply of his grace. There's nothing he is calling you to do that he won't do through you. Our power will be, will be made manifest through intercession. There'll be a portal from heaven to earth. There'll be angels ascending and descending to help us. There'll be infilling. There'll be indwelling. There'll be words embedded with power. We will never be alone. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us without a clue. If we make our living sacrifice, we'll know the will of God. And we'll be able to test and approve it and apply it in any situation. And even when we're struggling, the body of Christ can come around us and support us. But the one thing I think we need to do today is to drink deeply of his grace. To say in our heart, with all of our heart, I want it all. I want everything. And I want nothing that you don't want for me. We need to come and we need to be unashamed. Some of us need to be baptized. That needs to be our declaration. We need to quit dancing around the peripheral of the church. Am I a Christian? Am I not a Christian? What kind of Christian am I? Well, there's only one kind of Christian, a born-again Christian, from the inside out. Uh, Everything that we teach and everything that we preach is absolute insanity and cannot be received by the natural man. It can only be received by the spiritual man. If you're hearing this and you're believing it and you're receiving it, then it's because the Spirit of God is alive and well inside of you. And you're a born-again Christian. And there's only one kind of Christian to be, the kind that is entirely immersed into the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, in a relationship with Him, and the kind that wants to learn and to do everything He obeys, He commands us to do and to obey. That's all I got. Is that good enough for today? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you and praise you for your word, and we thank you and praise you for your spirit. And more than anything, Lord, we thank you for for yourself. Jesus, we thank you for you. If you hadn't come from heaven to earth to show us the way, if you had not died on the cross for our sins, if you had not poured out your blood to make make, uh, it right for transgressors, If you had not paid the price for our sin, then we would not be filled with the Holy Spirit. And even though we had the Word, without the Spirit, we couldn't understand it. And in our natural beings, we couldn't receive it. And I just lift up this church before you right now, Lord, and I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. I pray that you would speak through this passage. I pray that you would speak through their prayers. I pray that you would speak through their D groups. I pray that you would speak, speak, speak. I pray that we would hear, that we would gain your Word, and that we would retain it. Come and and make us strong in you, dear God. May this church grow deep roots. May you establish us and reestablish us according to the prophecy of Isaiah. May we be your spiritual Israel and we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor in advance. It's in your holy name we pray. We continue to pray through the lyrics of this song. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We are always so encouraged to hear when God is working in your life. If the messages of Monterey Church have touched you in some way, please share that with us by sending an email to info at montereychurch.net or by finding us on Facebook. Simply search Monterey Church in the search bar. And if you'd like to give to this ministry, you could do so by clicking the Give tab on our website to help us bring messages just like this one to you every single week.